I'd just like to thank the organizers for having me here. Um, I'll also say that it's been a really stimulating uh, workshop for me because I don't usually come to a workshop that's just focused on IANT. I'm not going to um, give an apology for my title because I'm going to talk about <laughs> Rydberg Adams, but I'm hoping that um, uh, maybe uh, some of this work can be applied in IANT traps. Um, you know, so maybe. Uh, my introduction to Rydberg molecules and some of the most recent work that we've done um, this year uh, that I'll present um, can give you a, a pretty detailed picture of, of uh, the structure of these molecules and um, their complexity, but hopefully uh, explained in a very stick and ball and, and simplified way so you can get a, in, some intuition about um, you know, the structure of these types of molecules. So this is not my work alone. This is work that um, uh, Hossein, uh, Seth Rittenhouse, and I and my research group, my graduate students, have um, been doing for uh, a good, good amount of time now. And um, in the end, the anisotropic work also involved Peter Schmelker and uh, Christian Fay from Hamburg. OK. So if you're just a, uh, a pure ion person, you can think of a Rydberg atom is basically an ion in a bad relation with the electron because the electron doesn't spend very much time with the ion core, with the ion, and they're always stuck together. So, oh man, I thought they'd at least get a few shots. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only group in the entire world that might even. <laughs> okay. So anyways, so the simple picture of these um, ultra long range Rydberg molecules. Um, it's kind of depicted here in this little cartoon. And the idea is, is that if you put a ground state atom within the orbital of the Rydberg electron, that it will interact with that atom. It will basically scatter off the atom, spend a little bit more time there, and that will lead to some uh, binding energy as long as the scattering length uh, between the electron and the ground state atom is negative. So there's very little interaction with uh, between the core and this atom, but there's enough interaction between the electron and the ground state atom uh, that you can form a molecule at ultra cold temperatures. And it was, uh, you know, Hossein and collaborators, Chris Green and Alan Dickinson, you know, who first kind of realized that you could observe these at, at ultra cold temperatures. And then they were observed at the uh, University of Stuttgart um, uh, later on, and then uh, when I left there, uh, after a, a, a long sabbatical, um, I came and did some work on that uh, at my research group in Oklahoma on cesium, or it's Eastern, um, in uh, rubidium. This is the simplest explanation of uh, the formation of these. That's where we started. Um, these types of molecules have interesting potential curves, and I've kind of showed the simplified version here. These are just considering this S-wave scattering. Um, it was really Fermi that realized how to do the zero range um, scattering approximation, um, which uh, gives these interesting oscillating potential curves. So plotted here is the energy versus the internuclear um, separation. And the idea is, is that the wavelength of the electron is so long that basically it's a, the ground state atom is a weight scatterer for the, for the electron. And it can just be characterized the bond, basically the energy that um, binds the molecules together, can be just characterized by that scattering uh, parameter. Although, um, unlike at very low temperatures, it does have an energy dependence to it. Okay, so um, there's uh, a singlet uh, and a triplet uh, scattering cha or channels um, because of the electron spin, but um, usually um, the singlet is neglected because it's small. I'll show where that approximation is not exactly right later. Um, but uh, all you have is this delta function potential with the scattering length, and when you sandwich that between the uh, Rydberg uh, wave functions, what you basically reproduce is a potential well that mimics the wave function. So in red here is shown uh, a particular Rydberg wave function. I think it's around 30 something, and then here's the potential that you would get from uh, calculating um, this right here. Okay, so you get all these little wells here, and they can support bound states with small binding energies, but not small compared to the temperature, so you can observe. If you go to what we call Stark-like states, which are the 
hygienic like states in a um, Rydberg manifold. Those states are highly degenerate and things change a little bit there. They, the potentials become superpositions of lots of wave functions. And this is where you get these interesting uh, gigantic dipole moments that you've heard about and I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, but for low L, low angular momentum states, those are the states that are broken off from the hydrogenic uh, manifold because uh, the atom, uh, the electron will interact with the core electrons in the, in the ion. Um, those low angular momentum states actually behave more or less like this, at least in the, the crudest approximation. Okay. Um, the, real, the real potential pairs are much more complicated because there's other effects um, that uh, Florian uh, spoke about a little bit. Um, and those effects make it that not every kind of Rydberg atom, so any every generic Rydberg atom behaves the same. So these molecules for different types of atoms are different, and we've learned a lot by studying things like rubidium, cesium, uh, strontium. And um, I've shown uh, cesium potential curves here, and then rubidium potential curves over here. Um, this is for N equals 35. S, this is for cesium 31S, and you can already see that they're quite different. There's a lot of avoided crossings here. There's not avoided crossings uh, here. Um, there's two reasons for this, is that the energy structure of the two atoms are different. Um, so uh, cesium uh, S states are almost degenerate with these high L manifolds, um, or if that's not true in rubidium, or not as true in rubidium, although the quantum defect is small. Um, but also, uh, Florian talked about measuring these P wave effects. They're also uh, critical in um, these types of molecules for the alkalis because there are resonances there. So what this means is basically that these quasi resonances allow the electron to kind of almost stick onto the ground state atom. So there's a resonant interaction when it scatters from the ground state atom, particularly at certain energies. And in rubidium, those energies are kind of almost all degenerate and lumped here towards higher kinetic energy. So this is the kinetic energy of the electron as it collides with the ground state atom. So because it's way far out in the orbit um, and the ground state atom is uh, located far away from the core, the electron's not traveling very fast out there. And it's mostly kinetic energies below about 0 0.02 um, this is an EV um, that uh, contribute most strongly to these potential energy curves around these uh, levels. Um, so rubidium is like this. You saw this on Monday. Um, cesium is like this. So it has separated resonances that are pushed towards lower electron kinetic energies. So what this means is the P wave scattering is going to be much more important <coughs> than uh, cesium than rubidium. So Already in the kind of the crudest approximation, you can see that the, the atoms are really going to behave uh, differently. So, how can you see this in cesium? Um, these are potential curves uh, plotted with no P wave interaction, and these two here um, have P wave interaction. These are for D states, and the effect of these resonances are to uh, put these large uh, features into the potential curves here. Uh, one of them is blown up uh, right over here, and you can kind of see one uh, back here. So that they really, those P wave, P wave resonances really perturb um, the way that the Rydberg atom interacts with this ground state atom. And you can see there's three of them, and they correspond to these internuclear separations because that's for this state where the electron um, is traveling at this kind of uh, low kinetic energy, that would be the outer one, then this would be the higher kinetic energy, and then this is the higher yet kinetic energy. Okay? Um, the P wave uh, uh, effect can be taken into account in um, uh, a way that's similar to um, the S wave. The difference here is that you have a gradient operator that takes, uh, that, uh, that is kind of part of this pseudo potential. Uh, instead of just a de uh, instead of just a uh, delta function itself. Okay. So, given this kind of level of approximation, there's kind of 
uh, let's say, three classes of um, these types of molecules for diatom. Um, the first one is a symmetric one. This is where the Rydberg state separated out from the Stark manifold. Uh, it's symmetric. It has no dipole moment. Um, it's not really di hard. Um, this one is dipole allowed from, uh, from low uh, L states, intermediate states, with low numbers of photons. There's the um, L greater than 3. Um, this is part of the Stark manifold, where uh, the scattering of the electron is, is dominated by S-wave scattering. Um, this is the so-called trilobite molecule. And this thing is a diatomic molecule that has a gigantic dipole moment of the size of a kilodivide. And the reason it, it does that, it has this, is that by mixing these states of different parity, you can create a wave function that looks like this. The Rydberg core is right here, and the ground state atom is sitting right here. So if we were to look at the probability of where we find the electron, there would be a high probability to find it on the ground state atom. This is negatively charged, positively charged, so you get a gigantic dipole moment. <coughs> uh, similarly, for P wave uh, dominated um, scattering for L greater than 3, these have large dipole moments. They tend to be a bit smaller than those. You get uh, two different kinds of states, pi states and sigma states, uh, because of this added angular momentum. And you get wave functions that look something like this that also actually have a dipole moment, like I said. Okay, so um, I already kind of discussed this. This is if we sum those kind of stark states, uh, we can get, uh, we have degenerate states of opposite parity, we can mix them, and then we can get a dipole moment. That's kind of how this happens in very, very small fields. Um, and then we can um, create this type of uh, molecule. So just to kind of now show that this, uh, level of theory is um, uh, is kind of useful and uh, you know for a while was kind of um, you know how we thought about um, these molecules I'll talk to you a little bit about exciting um, some of these uh, you know molecules that have a very large dipole moment so remember I said that in those pure cases the trilobite is dipole forbidden but if we also consider that the um, the P wave resonances and the near degeneracy in, of the uh, Stark manifold with S states in cesium um, mix all those states together. Most of the states in uh, cesium in the S, you know, that are correlated fairly strongly to S states, which we can reach by optical transitions, will be mixed with those kind of high angular momentum states. And so in reality, you don't have the pure cases, you have mixtures of S states, which is kind of depicted here in this, um, this is the real wave function for a particular state, this part, which is the S state part of this wave function, and then the asymmetric part of the wave function, which has the giant dipole moment. And so this is a trick you can use in cesium to actually observe um, these trilobite molecules. So this thing is mostly a trilobite, but it has enough S state in it that you can excite it with a low number of photons, two photons. So um, we do this in an optical dipole trap. Um, uh, we have uh, lasers to um, probe uh, these molecules. We basically <coughs> observe them spectroscopically by observing um, the states. Uh, we ionize them, project them down on a uh, MCP, and, and detect them. Um, they're detected by two-photon transition. We adiabatically try to eliminate the intermediate states so that we can get a, a narrow line width on that transition. Um, and these are fairly convenient uh, um, wavelengths to generate so that uh, uh, we can excite these guys. So this is a spectrum of uh, basically 37S plus 6S, 39S plus 6S, and 40S plus 6S. Um, this is the Rydberg state. These are the ASM. Um, states if you pull uh, the molecule apart. Um, these have kind of odd looking spectra compared to some of the spectra that were observed at, uh, uh, in Stuttgart. And it's basically that they're very broad here in these cases. And part of that is the laser resolution, but the laser resolution is around a megahertz or so. 
Um, but most of it is, is because we're exciting these molecules with these giant dipole moments, and the background electric fields inside the chamber are causing the energy shifts of the molecules excited at different angles in the, you know, in the uh, gas, which is not oriented in any way. So sometimes you'll excite a molecule that's, you know, parallel to the electric field, with dipoles parallel to the electric field, and other times it'll be anti-parallel. And so, of course, the anti-parallel ones have higher energies, and the and the parallel ones have lower. Energies. And so you get a flat top kind of distribution. And you can use that to measure the dipole moment of these molecules because at, at lower fields you'll measure something that's kind of flat top. And as the field grows, you measure something, the line actually broadens in this kind of distinctive flat top way. And so what you're measuring is then the shifts of the dipole in the field that you've applied. The line isn't zero here because we start out with a background electric field that we can't get rid of. You know, it's about, I think in this case, it was a maybe like five to, to nine uh, millivolts per second, something like that. So here's a measurement for this particular state. And if you change the field, you can watch and see how wide the peak is. And you can convert that by fitting that data into a dipole moment. And for this particular state, the dipole moment was basically 2.3 kilodivide, which is gigantic, right? That's probably the biggest dipole moment of any molecule. You can do that for a bunch of states, in which we did, to show that they kind of all uh, behave the same and they were consistent with the, the theory that um, Seth and, and Hossein put together uh, based on the physics that I already described. So this is kind of an example of how far you can get with the, that kind of basic physics. Um, if you go to the blue side of the line, you can see um, states that are dominated by um, the P wave scattering, which are these butterfly uh, states. So here's the 31S asymptote. And you can kind of see these guys cutting down through that 31S state. And you can actually measure states here to the blue side of this line as well. Um, showing that really it is true that these kind of higher angular momentum states are uh, cutting down across uh, the 31 acids in mixing. So still the same physics. Those states, of course, have, um, there's more than one state, like I said, and if you put them in an electric field um, that's parallel versus perpendicular in the, um, in the kind of uh, case where you would uh, excite the, you know, use the laser polarization um, that's you know, orthogonal to the electric field, you get two states that split, and in the other case you get one state, um, uh, this is the sigma state and these are the two um, pi states. And you can look at that. You can see here too that the, the dipole moment's quite a bit lower, it's lower by at least a factor of 10 in this case. All right, so what's missing? that we had to include before we could do um, more work was spins, basically. So we haven't taken into account are the spins of the electron and then the spins that are on the ground state atom and uh, on the, and the core, okay? So what we have so far are terms that um, basically describe um, P wave scattering and S wave scattering in singlet and triplet channels. That's the, the triplet and singlet are the scattering of the electron off of the ground state atom. And then these guys. But we don't have hyperfine structure on the ground state of the Rydberg atom. The hyperfine structure on the Rydberg atom is small, so it doesn't really matter. This is uh, for cesium, this is right, nine gigahertz. Um, spin orbit um, of the um, the Rydberg atom, the spin orbit of the ground state. Well, the ground state is an S um, state, this molecule here. So that one doesn't count. So basically, um, we have these. And although these look kind of innocuous and you wouldn't put them in, and this is why they weren't put in at the beginning, um, what these guys end up doing is they end up mixing the singlet and the triplet uh, scattering channel. Uh, so um, if you remember, when we're talking about the Fermi theory, I said that the 
scattering length, the S wave scattering length for the singlet channel was small, and usually it can't, uh, it doesn't have enough um, strength to really bind the molecule together. But if you have these spin effects that mix the singlet and triplet channel, then you have enough strength in that mixed channel to then bind. And this is uh, this was realized by um, Garrett Rydell's group at uh, Michigan first. And so. Um, this is kind of more or less the full Hamiltonian now with these two pieces. There's a couple of other pieces that are added in here that um, I haven't explicitly put in or I included in H0 um, that also matter. Um, there's uh, spin orbit uh, splitting for those different P wave uh, resonances, and uh, there's and you know those have to be taken into account. The coupling between those <coughs> channels and the scattering. Um, and then there's a subtle term that was um, pointed out by Chris Green and his students, which is, the, which is that the electron spin precesses during that collision and it's in a different frame, so you have to take that into account, um, and the rest of them I told you about. So now the problem gets a bit more complicated, and in fact you can see uh, the effects of those complications. So. Oh, I plotted here potential energy curves that were calculated by um, Seth and Hossein um, for 32p, and their the energy states here are correlated with this with the spectra, uh, spectra from uh, 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 Frederick Merck's group. And the thing that I wanted to point out is that this would be the only state that we would have calculated before we looked at the. Um, this mixing between the singlet and triplet channels, but there is another shallower state here that also exists because of those mixed channels. So in the calculations, you can see this. Um, you can see this effect in the spectra too. This is a cesium spectra at 40 d, um, and this guy corresponds to the low point in a corresponding potential here, and this guy corresponds to the uh, an outer um, well in um, the pure triplet state. Okay, so things get a little bit more complicated as we as we go on. That's the full uh, potential. This is the full interaction Hamiltonian, but I just wanted to point this out because this is a full calculation, and I can show you the different effects again that I just mentioned. So at long range here, this is a, a D state. Kind of the S wave scattering part works. So that's why all these curves lie on each other. That, that's what makes these ones fairly simple. But then you can kind of see the P wave guys cutting in here, and then you can also see the effect, the spin effects of splitting these curves here. So at long range, where the electron really is going slow, then the physics really does look like just this Fermi pseudo potential of the electron scattering off of the ground state atom, but as you um, go further in where the P wave effects start to take and dominate things and where the spin orbit effects start to become uh, more important, then you get kind of a series of more complicated potential energy curves. Kind of uh, running out of time here, so um, this just shows if you calculate all the states, you can um, you know, do a, a fairly good job of matching all the all the lines, which is actually impressive because this is a very highly excited molecule and you can get kind of megahertz and even in some cases, you know, kilohertz type um, agreement. Now, you know, you're making these simplifications in the calculations, you're not doing an ab initio calculation, but you're doing a calculation based on scattering properties for the most part. So this is uh, data from uh, Tillman Files group and this is the anisotropic molecule part, which I'll try to cover um, pretty quickly. And uh, what they started to do was put more, more and more atoms inside the cloud, basically by uh, using a higher principal quantum number to make the orbital bigger of the electron. And I've already discussed some really nice experiments that they've recently done in that direction. But the observations were that uh, basically if you had an S state, this was kind of more or less isotropic, and as you put more and more atoms inside that cloud, 
basically what you did is you got multiples, you, know, you saw lines at multiples of the binding energy of a single ground state atom. So this meant that basically the binding energy or the, or the each of these interactions was independent of one another. They basically just added up. So if you had uh, two atoms inside here, you would see a kind of a, a ground state line that was uh, two times that of the dimer. So the trimer is two times the dimer, so on and so forth. But these were symmetric wave functions. They were S-states. Um, we started to do experiments on D-state, and what we actually saw was that, that that's not true for the D-state. Okay. And I'm not going to bore you with this whole thing, but um, you basically put together wave functions that are symmetric and anti-symmetric, and what you can work out is that if you're in S state, then uh, the uh, E plus energy basically goes to the sum of uh, the interactions of each of the, uh, the atoms independently, and that the other just converges to the asymptote. Okay? If the um, atoms are not uh, all in the same N and L M states, which means for equal R, um, which means that they can be in different M states really practically from what we're talking about, um, then you get an angular dependent potential and the angle depends on um, the opening angle between the positions of the two atoms in the, uh, the Rydberg electron cloud. And those energies are shown here, so there's minima at pi over two for the atom, and then there's minima in the in kind of the two stretched, the linear configuration where you have one on one side and one on the other side. Okay. Now this isn't the full story because this is uh, this is the simplest picture. This is just with um, this is just with uh, uh, kind of S wave scattering um, here, and. What you would kind of see here, right, is a kind of a big blur of stuff, right, because these guys overlap with each other. But it turns out that if you add in um, the hyperfine effects and you add in the fine structure effects, you get a splitting between these states, and then you can observe kind of two different um, types of, of these molecules with anisotropic potentials. It's those interactions that split everything. So you need the spin interactions to really be able to produce the spectra in this case. So this is an important case. And we observed these in experiments, so um, basically the gray line here is if you didn't include trimers, the black line is if you do include trimers, and then um, the uh, blue line here is the data. And you can't really in the experiment separate out the trimer signal from the dimer signal, so it's all convolved together, so it looks a little complicated but it's pretty clear that there's at least places in the spectra that can't be explained unless you assume that we're getting uh, these trimers as well. And so that was kind of the, the interesting result that came out of uh, um, the D states. So that's where I'll kind of uh, conclude, and I think I'm actually almost on time. Um, so I kind of gave you an overview of these ultra long range molecules. Um, I'm hoping you got kind of at least the stick and ball picture of some of the effects that that, uh, um, that uh, go into their structure. Um, I joke with Hossein and, and Peter that adding all the spin stuff kind of ruined it for experimentalists because at the beginning you could just think of uh, this very kind of elegant, you know, fairly pseudo potential scattering picture. But of course, you do more experiments, you see new things, and um, that uh, basically. Uh, um, gives you new insight into the structure, more detailed uh, picture of it. Um, the atoms aren't all the same. Uh, a lot of the stuff I've told you was kind of highlighted by comparing and contrasting the results from different groups uh, on different atoms. And I think um, we'll look that, I guess, on that. Yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you, Jim, for For the D state formation, uh, is the probability of that happening much higher than for uh, the S state? Uh, and the, um, 
they, they, bear, they have essentially the same range, and we're really probing the outer wells in those. Um, you're, you can excite these in a, in a trap, but even at kind of 10 to the 13 per cubic centimeter, 10 to the, you know, something like that, um, you're still kind of sampling from the fluctuations in the density distribution. So you don't really sample so easily inside unless, you know, you kind of go to a BC and kind of increase the density. I was just having a crazy idea, which is that uh, what would become those kind of systems if you would have rubidium and cesium, like heteronuclear? Oh, they kind of—they would be. I think they would be interesting because you could compare the structure, right? I mean, yeah. you would have it. What you are able to do there then is change the scattering length for the electron scattering off the yeah. ground state atom, and then you get these. You know, then you might be able to change the electronic structure, so you might. So there will be change, but do you expect that it will be even more complicated, or it will be just like another? Oh, I think it's another alkali, you yeah. know, another version of the atom. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I don't. Know, maybe maybe someone else has a comment, but I think that really, I mean, if you look at all the physics, and one of the interesting things about these molecules is you can predict the binding through scattering properties of the electron off of the ground state atom. So that's the important part really right there. I mean the, the structure of the of the atom matters a little bit too because of how that how the scattering is affected by the structure of the liver. So I can't see anything super what is interesting is that I think like Hussein and Seth and others now have done calculations where you, instead of an atom you put a dipole yeah. And then the scattering properties of the electron off of that dipole change, and that's physics. That's different physics to a certain extent. Question on the I think the quantum scheme has kind of started thinking of if you start from a molecule that has a fairly large P wave character, that you may um, use later to. Um, Output to the negative ion ground state and then generate um, heavy ripples. Yeah, yeah, this is interesting. Yeah. So would that maybe be favorable in the season where you have these uh, wells that are very well dominated by um, We thought a little bit about that, but um, in fact, I mean, this is one of the first things we thought about when Stuttgart is okay, now you can stick the electron onto the ground state atom and you make a you know, an ion pair, you know, get to the ion pair state because it's got to be partially kind of an ion pair state. Um, and so we actually, even in, at uh, Stuttgart, when we first did the rubidium, we actually looked for ion pair states, but uh, the electro configuration of the trap wasn't right for that. So I think these are, this is interesting, and I know also Tosin and others have thought about this. Not, uh, just to close the session and uh, thank Jim again for the talk.